Revelation 22, um, verses 12 through 17. Verse 12 and 13 uh, are written in red for a reason. Look, I am coming soon, bringing my reward with me to repay all people according to their deeds. I am Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Then John picks it up again. Blessed are those who wash their robes. They will be permitted to enter through the gates of the city and eat the fruit from the tree of life. Outside the city are the dogs, the sorcerers, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idol worshipers, and all who love to live a lie. Verse 16 is Jesus speaking again. He says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this message for the churches. I am both the source of David and the heir to his throne. I am the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come. Let anyone who hears this say, come. Let anyone who is thirsty, come. Let anyone who desires drink freely from the water of life. One of the things that I believe that God is doing right now on the earth is he's preparing for his return. Oh, and if you'll listen, you can almost hear his footsteps as he makes his way. Now, the spirit and the bride say, come. The spirit and the bride, we say it in concert with him, come. You can come. We want you. Now, we don't know the day or the hour, but we can know and do know the seasons. We can discern the seasons. We may not know the exact, in fact, Jesus doesn't know. According to John 5, he said, I can do nothing apart from what I hear my father say or do, right? He still lives in that. So he's waiting himself for the father to turn to him and say, you can go. It's time. And I think that, you know, we are seeing in the world today, of course, there's so much turmoil and, and strife and pain and all those things. I believe those are just uh, birth pains. I think, I think the, uh, uh, the return of the Lord is coming through that process. We are in preparation. Yeah. The earth is in preparation. Yeah. Um, if, I, if Angie and I are going to go on vacation... We don't pack on the day we leave. We pack before then. Because if you pack on the day to leave, it's too late. Especially if you've got to catch a plane. Planes don't wait for you. You're either on or you get left. And so it, you've got to prepare. You've got to get ready. So what I, what I want to do tonight, I really don't have a title. I just, uh, I just want to share what's been what I've been feeding on in my heart lately and, and what, I've, what I feel like the Lord might be saying. What I want to do is really just inspire you, provoke you, encourage you to fall deeper and deeper and deeper with the person of Jesus Christ. Yeah, yeah. That's really what I, what I hope for, pray for tonight. And lately, even tonight, we saw it uh, two Wednesdays ago, there's something stirring in the atmosphere when we gather now, again, right? Uh, for a while, it felt as though we'd kind of, you know, there's, there are those ups and downs, those lull moments, and, and I don't really understand all that, but, but I believe that when a corporate cry comes together, when all of us together will cry for him at the same time, he can't help but to come. He can't help but to show himself. And I love you. I love you with my heart, but I'm not here to see you. I'm here for the promise and the hope that when we are together as the body of Christ, he manifests himself in such a way that I forget who you are, I forget who I am, and all I see is him. All I see is him. See, when we've truly seen him, when we become, when we become fascinated 
with him. He doesn't just show up on our Sunday morning worship sets. He doesn't just show up or he isn't just contained within a certain thing that we do. We love him then through our work or we love him through how we relate to one another. Our, our, our worship far, far excels and exceeds anything in this room, right? See, the goal is, is that when we gather here, it isn't the first time that we've been alone with him, that we've created a chamber for him, for him to dwell, for us to dwell with him personally. If it's not personal, it'll never be corporate. Now, what can be corporate is all of the stuff we do. And there is a difference, I believe, this is just me, I believe there's a difference between a spirit-led moment and an emotional moment. You can go to a concert and get emotionally connected to music. Music is a powerful medium. It's, it just is. But just because something is emotional doesn't necessarily mean that it's Holy Spirit. It can be. So how do I know the difference? Now, how do I know the difference? It's when I've been alone with him and I've learned to hear his voice in private. That then I recognize his voice when we're together. It's like, oh, yeah, that's him. That's him. So that's what, that's what, I, that's what I hope for tonight. Speaking of readiness, a couple weeks ago, I was uh, listening to a podcast, and uh, let, let me just say something about that. I, I want to encourage you to feed yourself on either uh, teachings or music, whatever. I just f- feed yourself. I, I find it helpful to me that when I'm struggling and there's some weaknesses or there's some places of lack in my life, I go to that area of lack and I start feeding that place. So it's important that Listen, Pastor Darren is not supposed to feed you. Now, he's here to encourage. He's here to teach, train. He's here to help disciple. But what his job is, what our job is for you is to show you where the food is, and then you learn how to feed yourself. Right? I will say my daughter was deeply impacted by a message that Pastor brought a few weeks ago on a Sunday morning, and she still talks about it. So I'm not saying that when you come in here, it doesn't, it's not to say the Holy Spirit can't speak through pastor or myself or whoever. Uh, what I'm saying is this can't be the only time you feed. I don't know about you, but I like to eat daily. If I just ate one day a week, I'd be weak, I would be sick, and I'd be near death. I have to feed myself every day. And guess what? My wife doesn't always fix food for me. I don't come home and say, okay, woman, first of all, plan my funeral. <laughs> second, there is no second. I'm dead, right? So, um, but I've, I know how to fix my own food. I know how to prepare myself something to eat. Now, if I'm able to do that in the physical, how much more then is it important, especially in the day that we're in right now, preparation day? Folks, listen, I've heard it my whole life. You have too. The Lord is returning soon, right? We've heard it over and over again. Listen, if you can't see the signs now clearer than ever before, then you you need to open your eyes. Open your eyes. Okay, so anyway, I'm listening to this podcast, and I heard this quote. And and when I heard it, you ever heard things and it's like, how did they know I've been thinking that? Or how did, how did he look inside of me? You know, it's one of those things. So he said, the Lord is through the power of the Holy Spirit. He's power washing his bride. He's power washing us of the veneers and the wardrobe and the makeup that we've put on ourselves to produce a beauty that we were never intended to have that's not beauty at all. So the church has gone around looking like Tammy Faye Baker. If y'all don't know who that is, look her up. But we've gone around with all this stuff slapped on us to make ourselves feel better, look better, appear better, and it's not beauty at all. It's makeup. 
There's a beauty that only comes from him. It's as if you set, how many of you love to soak up the sun in the summertime? You go to the pool or you go to the beach. The longer that you sit outside in direct sunlight, what happens to your skin? It changes color. For some of us, it gets red. Others of us, it gets a dark, leathery brown. We don't like you. Because I get red first. Then it fades and then I'm okay. But you understand what I mean? So if your body changes as a result of direct contact with the sun, guess what happens when your spirit comes in direct contact with the sun for extended periods of time? You don't get a sunburn in five minutes. You have to sit there. You have to bake. I'm talking to you spiritually too. We have to sit. We have to, we have to long for him. Longing for him as the deer pants after the water, so my soul longs after him. After him. And I know you may be sitting there thinking, God, just, I'm not there. I mean, I like to watch the office and eat popcorn. Listen, I'm not saying anything is wrong with that. What I'm saying is, you can have the grace of God on your life to pursue. There's a grace that God can give you. To pursue him. Amen? Yes, sir. Every Tuesday when we come in here for prayer, I'm going to be honest with you. There are, there are those Tuesdays when I'm tired. I'm physically drained. It's been a long day or, you know, just any number of things. And I come to prayer at 6 o'clock on Tuesdays. I'm praying. I'm saying, God, give me the grace to pray tonight. And guess what? He always does. Because he loves it when you come after him. So the beauty of Jesus is that he gives you the strength to come after him. That's the beauty of him. Sitting before him transforms us. One of the things that I believe that the Holy Spirit is power washing off of the bride is cultural Christianity. A Christianity that fits in a nice box but carries no power in it. A Christianity that's afraid to speak up the truth and walk in authority and live as children of God. A a Christianity that will just go with the flow. Listen, as days wear on, it's going to be more and more and more that as we pursue him, we're kicking against the grain of culture. Because you can't serve and seek after him and want to have intimacy with him and go downstream. You'll be fighting uphill from now until he comes. But as you rest in him and long for him, he gives you the grace to swim upstream because he's the prize. It's all about how we, how we handle, I think a lot about how we handle his presence. You remember Uzzah got killed for trying to study, study the ark? I I always had trouble with that. I'm like, God, what is your problem? Why would you kill him? He was only trying to help. But what, what we have to understand is they had it wrong from the beginning. The ark was never supposed to be on a cart. It was supposed to be carried on poles. Remember? The law had already been given to them. They knew what to do. They decided we've got a better way. We've got a better way. We know how to do this better than God does. So we put it on a brand new shiny cart, lights, wheels, gasoline. We're going to put this thing on a cart, slick, shiny. We're going to find out what they're doing down in North Carolina. We're going to do what they're doing. It was supposed to be carried. The presence of God is always supposed to be carried. And it's heavy. We don't treat his presence flippantly or without care. There's a solemnness to it. Here's the final, this is the final message that Jesus ever spoke publicly before he was ascended. It's in Matthew 22. Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. It's his last public commandment message and he's prophesying over Israel and over all of the redeemed throughout the rest of history all of your heart soul mind and the gospel of Mark adds strength 
all of us. So how do I love him with all of these areas of my life? He wants to anoint us to love him that way. He wants to anoint us to love him that way. So what I do is, Holy Spirit, show me how to love Jesus. It's a conversation. Holy Spirit, how can I appropriately love Jesus. Verse 38 says that this is the Father's number one priority. I've grown up my whole life. I've heard people say over and over, I just want to know the will of God for my life. I got it for you. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, body, and strength. Done. That's the will of God. Everybody's wanting a ministry. Everybody's wanting to be propped up over here. Give me a thing over there. Give me a platform. Give me a thing. Hey, let me. If you want a platform, you better get ready for death because that's the only way you're going to survive it. Look, I, I, don't, I don't want position, title. I don't want status. I want him. I want him. And whatever else he has in store for you, hell can't keep it from you as you stay connected to him. Forget everything else. Forget everything else. This is the measurement of success before God. Do you want to succeed before God? Love him only. Love him only. The measurement of success is not how many worship sets I've led or how many, how many sermons I preach or the buildings that we build or the programs that we start. None of that measures success. The success measured before God is when he looks at us and he, he determines how big was your heart response to me. That's the measure of success. None of this other stuff. All that other stuff is what we need power washed from. All that other stuff is window dressing and makeup. Girls, I'm not saying anything about makeup. I just don't wear it. Okay. Hallelujah. Luke 10, 38. I love this passage. You know where I'm going. This is probably my favorite story in all of the New Testament. Now, it happened as they went that he entered a certain village and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. Listen, I know we give Martha a bad rap in this story, but she was obviously sitting there because it says Mary was also sitting. So Martha at some point was sitting. She just got up a lot, okay? So verse 40, but Martha was distracted with much serving. You can serve God and be distracted in your serving. Serving God is a good thing, but it's not the thing. He is the thing. When your serving obstructs your view of him, you're no longer serving him. You're serving so that you can feel better about you. Okay? Let's keep him in our focus. So Martha was distracted with much serving, and she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. She sounds like a church person. <laughs> and Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about so many things. But one thing is needed. And Mary has chosen that good part which will not be taken from her. Only one thing is needed, sitting and beholding him. And I know the knee-jerk reaction for us is to say, but, but what about this and what about that and the pots and the pans and the children's ministry and the, and the parking lot and all, what about this and what about that? Only one thing. We have a multitude of things, don't we? All of us have a multitude of things. Jesus said only one thing. Only one thing is needed. And Mary found it. How many of you want to find one thing? I want to go after the one thing. And that one thing is a person. 
It's Jesus. It's Jesus. So, as he prepares us for his return, it's Revelation 22, 20. He who is the faithful witness to all these things says, yes, I am coming soon. See, hunger says, I'm in need. How many of you didn't have dinner tonight? How many of you didn't have anything to eat before you came to church? Several of you. How many of you are starting to get a little rumbly in your tumbly? Yeah, I'll get you out, Kelly. We'll, we'll get it. So when you're, when you're in need, you're saying, I'm hungry. Hunger says, I'm in need. That's actually a posture of maturity in the kingdom. To stay hungry. How do you stay hungry? See, everything in the kingdom is opposite. See, when we are physically hungry, we go eat and we're full. When you're spiritually hungry, you feast on him and you continue to, to desire. It's over and over and over and over again. But when you don't feed on him, suddenly you don't have need anymore. When you neglect him, when you don't spend that time with him, suddenly it's, we get to that place where we can, I, I know, God, I got this. I can do this. Yep. And his goodness and grace will say, okay, I love you, and I'll be here when you're ready. That's what he does. Yep. So may we have the one thing. Let me finish with this, okay? Psalm 132. This, was, this psalm was written by David's son and who would become his successor, Solomon. Solomon in this, in this passage of Psalm 132 is reflecting on his father's life. He was reflecting on David's life and a, a specific vow that David had made before the Lord and that vow kept him his whole life. Look what it says in Psalm 132. This is Solomon speaking. He said, now, Lord, remember David or remember my dad and all of his aff afflictions. How he swore to the Lord and vowed to the mighty one of Jacob. This is what his vow was. Surely I will not go into the chamber of my house or go up to the comfort of my bed. I will not give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling place for the mighty one of Jacob. Behold, we heard of it in Ephrath. We found it in the fields of the woods. Let us go into his tabernacle. Let us worship at his footstool. Arise, O Lord, to your resting place. You and the ark of your strength, let your priests be clothed with righteousness and let your saints shout for joy. It could be that David made this vow to God way back when he was a lad tending sheep in the fields. We're not exactly sure where it all started, but it could have been then. David, you, you know he would go out in the fields and play his harp. And David's whole life was lined up to this one vow that he desired to live a life that would be unto God finding a resting place on the earth. That was David's whole life. Now, I'm not going to say that David wasn't a complicated man. He was knee-deep in blood most of the time. He was an adulterer. He was a murderer. He was all these things, but he was also a man after God's own heart. Yes, sir. His vow was, I want to live a life unto God so that he finds a resting place on the earth. We know the stories of when demons would begin to come against Saul and he would call for David. Come, have David come and play for me. And when David played his harp for Saul, the demons would leave and Saul would find peace. So somehow... Word got out that David was able to play and that there was something that he carried. There was something about his worship, right? So, I don't know if he put on pop-up concerts every so often and word got out. I don't know. But somehow, some way, they something happened that everybody knew when David played, something happened. No stages, no platforms, no lights. No cameras, no Instagram or Facebook following, no record companies or tours or autograph sessions, no makeup. 
Just a boy with his harp in a field full of sheep making a resting place for the presence of the Lord. Talked about power washing, and I think I've mentioned this before. There is a stain on the current worship culture in America. We've turned our worship artists into rock and roll stars. We turned them into these popularity, we made a popularity contest of, of who this is and who that is. And my latest single, I got this gold award or I got this Grammy or I got the. And so there's a stain on our worship culture in America. I say it's time for us to shut it down and go back out in the field and not be so concerned with whether or not I have X number of followers, but have I made a resting place? Have I made a resting place? David was marked by a vow that he made with his life that he wanted Jesus. He wanted the presence of Jesus to find a place to rest on him. David's success with the lion and the bear and Goliath is not mapped to his bravery. It's not mapped back to his skill as a fighter. His success against all those adversaries can be marked back to a vow that he made before the Lord. That wherever you are, God, you can rest on me. You can rest on me. It's Psalm 27, 4. One thing. I have desired of the Lord that I will seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. How many of you know he wasn't talking about First Baptist Church of Jerusalem? He was going to be the habitation of the Lord, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. One thing. We don't need a multitude of things we need one thing. We need one priority as a family, as a company of people gathered at Maranatha Fellowship. What does Maranatha mean? Come, Lord Jesus. Come. We, we as a body, as a family, gathered around one thing, him. I want to tell you this. The beauty of Jesus is the answer to every issue in this room right now. The beauty of Jesus is the answer to every issue in this room right now. And some would say, well, no, it's not that easy. It's not that easy because you like it that way. It's not that easy because some of us would rather have issues than to have freedom. Because issues get you attention. Freedom makes you stand on your own knowing who you are. It's time for the church to cancel our issues. Cancel them. Stop being the narcissistic, oh, I need somebody to come touch me. You touch Jesus, and that's all you'll need. And keep touching, and let him keep touching, and develop a relationship with him because he's coming. His return is upon us. And when he comes, it will be too late to say, come, Pastor Darren, come touch me. Somebody pray for me. Somebody intercede for me. No, it's over at that point. That's why I need to know him for myself and keep my lamp burning. My lamp is my responsibility. Now, if I can come and throw a log on yours for you, great. But your fire's not my responsibility. It's yours. Trim your wicks. Go buy some oil. And keep your flame burning. That's on you. That's on me. Buying oil is expensive. What does it cost? Everything. It means I get up in the morning. And before I go do my thing, I close myself off with him. Not because of obligation, but because of adoration. I have found him to be the pearl of great price. I have found him to be the end of everything that I've ever searched for. We have a weak and anemic church who just needs spoon fed. That's got to end. 
Listen, I'm so glad that when I was 16, I didn't still drink a bottle. My mom would have had to been thrown away somewhere. You understand what I'm saying? There's some point or another you have to move ahead. We have to move ahead. One thing. When David finally became king of Israel, he stands up and he leads the nation of Israel in the vow that he'd already established with God. It's in 1 Chronicles 13, 3. It is time to bring back the ark of our God, for we neglected it during the reign of Saul. It's time to get the ark back in the room. It's time to get the ark back in the room. It's time to get presence back in the foreground. He's saying, I made this vow with the Lord. Now I'm your leader. Now my vow is your vow. That's what he was saying. So the people are like, come on, man. What are you going to do? Sit in a room and sing to Jesus all day long? We got to get stuff done. We got to be productive. Isn't that the reaction of the church of all of us? We got to get, come on, we got to get stuff done. Listen, when you sit with Jesus, you're getting stuff done. You're getting more done by being with him than anything you could do of your own strength and power. So here's the thing. Though through through the vow that David made with the Lord, then God turns around and makes a vow back to David to fulfill everything that David would ever desire. And we see it in the rest of 132, Psalm 132. For your servant David's sake, do not turn away the face of your anointed. The Lord has sworn in truth to David, and he will not turn from it. I will set upon your throne the fruit of your body. If your sons will keep my covenant, my testimony, which I shall teach them, their sons also shall sit upon your throne forever. He's, he's, he's giving him generational blessing and provision. For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his dwelling place. This is my resting place forever. In other words, God's saying, you got it. I'm resting on you. I will rest on you because you want me to. Here I will dwell, for I have desired it. I will abundantly bless her provision. I will satisfy her poor with bread. I will also clothe her priests with salvation, and her saints shall shout aloud for joy. There I will make the horn of David grow. I will prepare a lamp for my anointed. His enemies I will clothe with shame, but upon himself his crown shall flourish. When you say to God, I want you to be a resting place. I want you to find in me a resting place for your presence. He will. And then he will cause you to rest on him. And everything that you've ever desired comes to pass as you've made him your resting place. Listen, coming to a church building, this is not the house of the Lord. This is the house of the Lord. This is where we gather right? This is where we gather. We enjoy it. We enjoy the fellowship. We enjoy coming together as the body of Christ. We are to forsake not the assembling of ourselves together. So that's what this is for. But this, your heart, yourself, your life is the resting place of God. How many of you want that to be so? Stand up for me, if you will. How many of you want that to be so? If you would, just lift your hand and say, me, I want, I want my life to be the resting place of the Lord. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray it right now. Oh, Father, that you would give us the grace to host your presence on our life in the earth. Because, Father, the world, those that live in darkness, they've heard us talk about Jesus. And the reason they still don't want anything to do with him is that they've never seen Jesus displayed. They can hear our rhetoric and they can hear our talk. But until they see the fullness of him shining through our life, they'll never know. So, Father, I pray you make us a resting place. In fact, let's do that. Let's make that vow to him. Oh, God, I want to spend the rest of my life that you would be resting on me. I want to make my life a resting place for your presence. Take out whatever needs taken out. Rearrange whatever needs to be rearranged. But, God, I give you full access. I want to be like David and say, oh, God, this one thing I've desired, that I might dwell in the house, in the presence, in the person of Jesus all the days of my life. Because soon, soon and very soon, soon and very soon, the skies will split open and you will descend. And those who know you, who know you, not know of you, 
but those who know you. There will be those who stand before God to hear you say, depart from me. I never knew you. But, oh, God, did we not cast out demons? Did we not prophesy? Did we not pray loud prayers? Did we not sing worship songs? Did we not go to church every Sunday? But he will say, depart from me. I never knew you. Oh, God, that we would know you. And more than know you, host you. Make it so, Father, in us. Can we just take a moment and just worship him? Oh, Father, we thank you. Lord, I thank you. In the frailty of my own words, I trust that the seed of what you want planted inside of us would happen to grow. We worship you. Oh, God, we worship you. Father, we bless you. Let us be a hosting place. What if all of us in this room would decide my life is going to host him, and then we all get together, and every time we get together with each of us being a host for the presence of the Lord, then when we get together in this room, all bets are off. Anything is possible. And then at that point, it's no longer about Andy sing us our favorite song or Pastor Darren shout us down or this or that. We're not here for any of that. We are all gathered because we're hosts. We come together as hosting his presence. And then when we come together in that atmosphere, signs, wonders, miracles follow his word because we're so connected. We're so connected. We're so connected. We're more connected to him than we are what, what, what we post on Facebook. In fact, I decree that there comes a day when we don't even care about social media anymore. It's, a, it's becoming a cancer. It's sucking life out of people. It's an addiction. And I'm standing right here in front of everybody saying it's me too. Oh, God, we want to host you. We want to host you, Lord. We want to host you when we're driving down the highway. We want to host you when we're at Walmart or, or Kroger's. We want to host you. God, wherever we may be, we host you. It's awareness, Lord. Make it so, Father, we pray. Make it so, we pray in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Some of you are going to start prophesying over your own lives. You're not even going to need somebody to call you out. You're going to be able to hear his own voice for yourself. You're going to be looking in the mirror, getting ready for work, and suddenly you're going to start speaking things over your life. You're going to wonder where that came from. And then suddenly you'll know, oh, that's right. I've got connection. I'm hosting someone greater than me. You're going to start laying hands on coworkers at the office. You mean at the office? Yeah, at the office. Somebody's going to come alongside you. You're going to pick up, you're going to pick up by the Holy Spirit that somebody's got issues in their body, and you're going to say, hey, would you care? Can I pray for you? And you're going to tell them why, and they're going to freak out because you knew that. How did you know that? It's because I'm hosting somebody, and he's real, and he's here, and he loves you, and he cares about you, and the reason why I want to pray for you is because he loves you so much, he doesn't want to see you hurting with that anymore, and suddenly they're going to let you pray, and they're going to freak out, and then they're going to say, wait a minute, how can I get that? And boom, just like that, another name is written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. That's revival. So God, do it in us all. In us all. How many of you really hunger for it? Come on. How many of us really hunger? I mean hunger. I mean that the paint comes off the walls in this room because we've hosted him so well that from Sunday to Sunday it doesn't, I mean, we can't even contain that, oh, God, we want to see your glory. We want to see, I'm tired of reading stories of somebody else who had an experience that was so supernatural. I'm tired of reading books or watching videos or hearing other, body, other person's messages. I'm ready to see it for myself, God. I want to host you well. So, Lord, if there's sin in my life, Let's go ahead and take care of it right now. Go ahead. If there's sin in my life, God, if there's lust or pride or arrogance or addiction, or if there's anything, God, that I'm right now for me, if there's anything that you see, Lord, I'm asking you to cleanse that thing out of my life. Take those vices away. I lay them down before you right now, right now in Jesus' name. Some of you need to break an agreement that you've got with pornography right now. Some of you need to break that thing right now. 
now in Jesus' name. There's no shame in it. There's nothing for you to be ashamed of. It's for you to, to live and move in freedom. And so I decree it over your life. That bondage is broken in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Some of you are addicted to gossip. Yeah, see, we don't talk about that because that's okay. But I'm going to tell you something. Gossip is demonic. And gossip destroys. If you don't know the truth about something, keep your mouth shut. And spend that time before the Lord. I break the curse of gossip off the house in Jesus' name. I break the curse of gossip off this place in Jesus' name, off your life. If you have nothing good and fruitful to say to or about somebody, keep your mouth shut. God, that's me too. Sometimes I can run it. What else, Lord? See, because I want full access. I don't want there to be anything between me and him and I've let stuff man I've let some stuff God I break myself off of the need to always have to be on right here I don't have to be on right here I want to be on in here in my heart Do it, Father, in all of us, Lord. Take all the makeup off. Power wash us. I was listening to this podcast, and I'll finish with this. He said his wife had a dream that she was in a bridal shop trying on wedding dresses, and the attendant brought her some dresses, and she tries them on and they're skin tight and they're, they're cut too high or too low and it's revealing and she's, she peeks out of the curtain where she's trying on dresses and she says to the attendant, hey, hey, you know I'm a bride, right? Brides aren't supposed to be sexy. They're supposed to be beautiful. Oh, that we would be without spot and without wrinkle, a bride prepared for a bridegroom. That we live in the purity of the gown of his presence. Can I, sh can I tell you how practically in your own personal time at home, in your car, wherever it works for you, intentionally speak to him. Talk to him. Don't just spend time like Martha getting all the stuff ready. He doesn't need it. All he wants is you sitting there on purpose with him. So, Father, do it. Seal the word. Now in our heart, seal it. Haunt us with it. Bring us to it every time so that we make our vow like David, my life as a resting place for your presence. In Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. Let's love him one final time. Really big. Let's love him really big. Father, we bless you. We bless you, God. We thank you. Look at all these resting places for you, Father. Look at all these resting places. We honor you and thank you for it. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Go and be blessed in the name of the Lord and host him well as you go. In Jesus' name.